Happy Monday. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here. Thank you so much for listening. Just wanted to give you a quick update that so far out of our campaign on iFundWomen, we have raised $2,000. So thank you to all of you who have donated. We are raising money to continue to support the Support is Sexy podcast in bringing you interviews with inspiring women entrepreneurs five days a week. Around here, we're all about support being sexy and asking for what we need help with. And right now, what I need most is help in continuing producing the podcast at the level that you deserve. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, interviews with inspiring women entrepreneurs. So your donation, whatever amount it is, will help support with production, social media, all the great things that we need to keep the podcast going as strong as it is. I love all of you for being here. I appreciate any of you who have donated. Those of you who have not yet, please go visit supportissexylove.com. Again, supportissexylove.com. Check out the video there. Check out all of the great rewards and things that we're offering, whatever you can donate, even if it's $1. If everyone listening within the sound of my voice donated $1 to help support this movement, really, of women supporting women. And you know what? In the vein of that, I do want to pause to say I am sending love and support to all of our Muslim sisters out there who are listening Know that we are with you. We stand with you. It does not matter anyone's background, religion. Everyone deserves the right to freedom. So we are standing with you. Again, support is sexy. Nothing is sexier than women supporting women. And right now, some of the women in our world are being discriminated against, unlawfully detained, going through a terrible time just because of their beliefs or the country of their origin. So we are sending love to you from the Support is Sexy podcast to our Muslim sisters in the world. So thank you all so much for listening. And now the first episode of the week with another inspiring woman entrepreneur. This is Support is Sexy, episode 151, with Marie Jean Baptiste, founder and CEO of Rue 107. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I interview inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and their lessons to help you take your business and your life to the next level and create something sexy. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here because it just would not be the same without you. And I'm excited, too, to have our guest today, Miss Marie Jean-Baptiste. And Marie is the founder and CEO of the gorgeous, I mean gorgeous, clothing line Rue 107. Please do yourself a favor. Go to their site, Rue, R-U-E, 107.com and also to their Instagram page. Beautiful images. I mean, the clothes are amazing, but also the gorgeous images of women of all sizes, all shapes, all colors. It really is a beautiful collection of women and a beautiful space celebrating women, which is really what Marie is all about. And you will hear that in this episode as she talks about the journey of building her line, growing up in Haiti, wanting to be a fashion designer, coming to the United States, and her dream becoming a reality as she began to enter turn with a fashion designer who was her idol at the time. But Marie really goes into her journey throughout that time, how it wasn't always easy. And thank you, Marie, for being so open about that. Her journey within the fashion industry and the challenges that she faced and still faces, the lessons that she learned. But all throughout, she has always been about inclusion, really making sure that women are celebrated through her clothing and through her designs. So on this episode, you'll also learn from Marie the importance of testing, also why you have to develop a service mindset, how not having access to capital can benefit you, the challenge of having a straight and plus size line, the reality of being one of just a few black women designers in the fashion industry, 
the lesson Marie learned about quote unquote black and quote unquote urban brands, the fashion business is not designed for women of color to win. And Marie goes into that and her experience with that. Also, what she learned about hiring and firing people, an important lesson for any of us that are in the stages of bringing in employees or working with consultants, hiring and firing is just going to be part of the job. Also, why you shouldn't put people on a pedestal in business, the greatest misconception people have about fashion and design, why social media does not equal sales. Don't get too attached to your product. Marie has great advice about that. Also, why you cannot operate from a space of fear and you should always leave room for growth. So I know you're going to love this episode. Tons of great information. And as I said, just really inspiring to hear Marie's journey from where she started to where she is now and all of the lessons she has learned. So now, without further ado, Marie Jean-Baptiste. So Marie, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so happy we could connect and I'm happy to have you here. Thank you. I'm so happy to be talking to you. Your, your podcast is awesome and I'm, I'm so honored to be in your company and, and I'm excited. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Now, first question, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? I would say I, I ever since I was younger, I guess, um, I don't know, maybe high school-ish, um, I've always had a, an itch to do something a little bit bigger than what I felt like I was, I should be doing. Mm-hmm. So the best example of that for me was my father, who was an, who is an entrepreneur, um, and he spent his whole life doing what he always wanted to do. So that's always been, I, I got very lucky to grow up with that mindset. So for me, it was, I felt it was pretty early on. I knew I wanted to do my own thing, quote unquote. Um, and I knew I had to persevere and figure it out. So I, I don't remember having a clear moment where, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I always felt like it was part of my being. Um, what kind of entrepreneur was your dad? My dad is an educator. Mm-hmm. So he has, he had a school in Haiti. Um, and that's, pretty much what he did from 20 years old and he is 81 now Wow! <laughs> so yeah he's he's done it his whole life and that's his passion and he lived his truth doing it excellent now did you grow up in Haiti I grew up in Haiti I was born and raised there mm-hmm. um, and I moved to New York when I was 13 years old now what was a young Marie like a young Marie was very happy mm-hmm. <laughs> very cool I think I was a very curious child as well so I was always asking a lot of questions. I always wanted to uh, do things my own way. (laughs) I guess that's very common for a lot of kids, but I I just remember always wanting to do it differently. For example, uh, we, uh, one of my projects, one of my early uh, childhood projects, I remember vividly is uh, drawing the Virgin Mary Mm -hmm. and, you know, everybody drew it, drew her in very pale blues and very safe. And I gave her like yellow hair and a red face and, and I got in trouble for it. But thinking back on it, I, you know, it was just that need to be different and express myself, right. Instead of just doing what, what's expected of me. And and I just wanted to create a bigger conversation. Right. So. Such an early <laughs> example of you designing or creating in your own way. Exactly. exactly. So now, who were some of your greatest influences growing up? So growing up in Haiti, I would say, you know, again, my dad was pretty heavy in terms of um, the impact he had on, on myself and my siblings. Um, so, of course, I would say my parents, but also Haiti is a very colorful and creative culture in itself. So there was always there were a lot of artists, a lot of music. Uh, one of my favorite singers, Haitian singers growing up was Emine Michel. Mm-hmm. who performs here in New York sometimes too. Um, and I, I remember her being, you know, that I guess my first introduction to true black girl magic, you know, she was just so beautiful and talented and uh, vocally she was just amazing. Um, and after moving to America, I, I, I guess it changed quite a bit from just having creative people to follow as influencers, influencers, but um, also business people, mm-hmm. uh, and, and people in academics and just spiritual uh, leaders. So it's been a very interesting shift um, from having very creative men, uh, influ- influencers to just more well, creating a well, more well-rounded um, team of people who inspire my decisions and people who I just go to for different things and, and different um, purposes. So 
Who would you say inspires you um, creatively or as a designer? As a designer, my biggest influence is um, Leamington Ridley. Mm. So Leamington now resides in London. He was my first, um, he's the most talented designer that I personally know. And he taught me everything. Um, I used to be his intern, then became his employee, and then became his friend, who we are still friends. Um, and he designed these beautiful gowns, beautiful dresses uh, for ballroom dancing and, and New York elite women. He was a private designer. He, he was never interested in the glitz and the fashion side of it, quote unquote. But his technique and, and just his talent was so big and is still so big. But um, he left it all and became and followed his bliss into becoming a dancer. Um, so he's a professional ballroom dancer now uh, but he he's his talent is just just amazing and he still designs but his true passion is dancing and he he went for it when you interned with him at that point did you know that you'd want to start your own fashion line one day or how early on did you decide you know what fashion is my thing I wanted to be a fashion designer um as I guess I would say probably when I was around 16 years old, I made the decision I was either going to be an Avenue dancer or a fashion designer, mm-hmm. uh, to which my parents went crazy <laughs> they, or they didn't like that idea. So I knew um, my first, first design collection, I was 18. So I was right out of high school. Um, and that's how I met Leamington through that fashion show and a mutual friend introduced me to him. And um, so long story short, I, when I work with him, yes, I definitely knew I wanted my own line. I didn't know how it was going to pan out and what it looked like, but I knew I wanted it. How did you end up landing the internship with him? So I just, I just asked him, <laughs> you know, he's just, he was very warm. Like he's a, such a warm human being and very open. I just asked him, I saw his dresses and I was next to him and he knew some of the people I knew. And I said, I have to work for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he took me under his wings, and that was pretty much it. <laughs> so. so how did your own line, Rue 107, which we love, how did your own line um, develop? So I started online out of, you know, lack of resources, right? Like, I think, like, most people, you're, you know, when you have an idea, you're like, okay, I'm going to start a website, uh, start a Facebook page or an Instagram page and just see how it goes. So... To be completely honest with you, I did not have funding. I did not have, um, I didn't really know how those things work, you know, Mm -hmm. and I just said I'll make a few things um, and put it on my Facebook page and let's see who who bites. Right. (laughs) Um, Were you working with him still at that time? Yes. So when Leamington moved to London, that was, I would probably say before, uh, about a year or so before I actually started my my business. Mm -hmm. So... When I actually started, he was already gone. He left uh, New York and he left the industry. So um, by then, I just kind of felt like, okay, you have to do this. You don't have anybody to hold your hand. Like, you know, you just have to do it. It's time to just Like do now it. is the time. Exactly. Exactly. So that's how online started. Um, and it just kind of took a life of its own. And, um, and I never left it. <laughs> <laughs> now, what so. year was that? So I launched, I incorporated my business in the summer of 2010. Oh, so. So, sorry, 2011. Sorry, 2011. So it's been six years almost. Oh, my gosh. What would you say the journey has been like since that first day that you posted on Facebook? About your line, of course. Um, I would definitely say it became a lot more human. Um, I think, you know, that initial stage of I'm going to do this and this is going to be amazing and everybody's going to love it. And somehow that morphs into the longer you do it, it gets, I would say it gets more lonely and more challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's from that day till now, I think I'm a very different person when it comes to business. And and so much has happened. So much has inspired me to be who I am now and who I'm becoming. Um, so I would say I was very naive. I didn't have a formal training in fashion. So I think that made me even more naive, actually. So it was 
more like, oh, I'd love the, to design, but I never, I didn't know the business of fashion. I didn't know how things really worked in the industry. So, um, you also mentioned you didn't have um, funding or backing at that time. So how, how, um, what was that part of the journey? Like, did you seek funding or did you just think, oh, I'm just going to do this myself with a few pieces and see how it goes? The latter. So I, I still, I've, I'm not funded as still now I'm not. Um, but you know, I, I learned to build business credit. I took a couple of business loans. Um, I've, I learned to to be really lean, mm-hmm. to um, really test what works before, um, you know, investing more money and, and more time in things that doesn't work. But more importantly, it forced me to really learn and understand the customer and develop a service mindset versus telling people what they should be doing. Mm-hmm. It's more of a guiding and and inspiring and servicing you. So I think not having capital to <laughs> quote unquote play with, it really forces you to do it right because there there are no shortcuts. And if you have the capital and you don't do it right, you're going to pay for it later. And if you don't have the capital, you do it slower, but you do, learn to do it right. Right. That's a good point. Now you sell um, primarily on your website and on in your show from your showroom as well, right? Mm-hmm. We have a showroom in New York as well. We opened the showroom a year ago. Congratulations. That's a big deal. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, it's been, ooh, oh my God. <laughs> I know. How has it been? I mean, that's not a small, a lot of uh, uh, companies, you know, just sell online now, or even a lot of retailers are moving just to online now. So how has it been for you having a showroom the past year? So the showroom for us, um, you know, my, my idea is to create a truly size inclusive brand. Um, so back to backtrack a little bit, when we first started, it was only straight sizes. So straight sizes are sizes, you know, zero to like 10, 12 ish. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I started experimenting with larger sizes and that took a life of its own. And then everybody thought we're only plus size. <laughs> um, we're only a plus size brand. And my goal going forward is to really focus on the woman versus her size. It's really to bring everything back together in a, in a clean space and a beautiful space and uniting women of all cultures and sizes. Uh, so that's the, that's the dream. Mm-hmm. Um, and the showroom was played a pivotal role in that in terms of really l- understanding the customer and also understanding what holes I'm filling in the market. Right. Because one of the biggest challenges with e-commerce is you don't, you don't really get to touch people, right? You don't really get to see the customer. Mm-hmm. And, when I opened my showroom, we've had such a wide variety of women <laughs> coming in day in and day out. And it really opened my eyes to how big our potential is um, and women we can reach and women we can service. And it doesn't have anything to do with size at all. So the showroom was playing that role. It was playing more of that role than a retail space. Mm-hmm. And it served that purpose really well. And and we're now we're expanding it a little bit and then changing the inventory and just uh, creating a more robust schedule for it. So those are the things we're doing to make the experience better. But initially that was the idea behind it. It wasn't just to sell clothing. The selling was really not part of a big part of the showroom, the the idea behind the showroom. Tell people where the showroom is located in case they're nearby and want to stop by. Sure. The showroom is located at 260 West 36th Street and that's Suite 503. New York, New York, 10018. Excellent. So you have to go visit everyone listening. Uh, Not everyone at once, but go (laughs) visit and um, get to experience. I guess it's really having your customer really be able to have a different experience, right? Exactly. Having a different experience, learning how our sizing works. Um, You know, a lot of having a size inclusive brand is challenging because as much as I would, as much as I hate this fact, it's just you know, straight size women and plus size women a lot of times don't shop at the same places and they don't have the idea that they can shop together. Like, you you know, we might not actively it think about it. It feels like it has to be either or. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So it ha- it's very challenging to create a space that's safe for um, me, who's a size four, or my sister, who's a size 20. Um, it, it's quite challenging. So, 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 yeah, it's... Um, How do you overcome that challenge? Is it just by having something like having a showroom or a space where all women can come as opposed to just what's on, you know, either social media or on your website? 
You know, absolutely. So it's definitely a challenge. We're currently working on, on, on working through it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the showroom was a big stepping a stepping um, step. Uh, a stepping stone in that direction. So we've always been a very, we've had a very organic growth. It's always been a word of mouth brand. Um, so the showroom was really to go back to our, to, to our first point of connection, which is how we handle our customers, creating that one-on-one relationship, cultivating that. Um, the next step is definitely to use a digital space in a better way to send that message out. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, you will be seeing a lot of variety in our models um, and in our social media channels and people we're collaborating with as well. And also going beyond the clothing and just really talking about the women who we want to cater to, the women we're currently catering to. Um, our customer base is so diverse and, and we just want to have more of a conversation with them and more of a dialogue. And we want to be inspired by you guys who, you know, who are, our rubes are. So, so the, that's that's the plan, and that's what we're doing. Um, hopefully, 2017, you will see a lot more of that. Since 2016 was really about building that in-person connection in the showroom, mm-hmm. and and assessing, you know, how we'll, we're about to uh, launch a completely new size chart that will reflect everything I'm saying. So we had to do a lot of work on our production and to really facilitate this message. So, who, who would you say is the Rue 107 woman? The Rue 107 woman, I would say, is anyone who really wants to make a statement beyond the obvious. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a woman who's curious, who, who, whose goal is to not just blend in, I guess, in terms of, it's not, a, it's, you know, we're not really, we're not trendy, but we're, we're, trend, we're, we're trend forward. We're not really special occasion but we're celebratory Mm. we want to celebrate women and and we want we want to be there for women who just want to add that extra punch in their wardrobe that's not as safe as what they might find at you know zara or a lot of other brands uh, they might shop on a day-to-day we're really here to give you that special kick without it being over the top and and not wearable that, that's where that's our mission <laughs> in a nutshell. Excellent. Now you mentioned celebration. I know your site says at the core of your business lies a celebration of sisterhood. So why would you say that celebrating sisterhood is important to you and to your brand? It's everything to me. Um, it's it's everything to me. I would not do what I do without you know my my team of women, whether it's at work or you know my business, my family, my friends. I. I'm so grateful for the women I have around me and that's, I really hope that can come across in, in our branding and our brand messaging uh, because it really is that, especially as a black woman in this industry, it's, it's such a, it can be such a lonely space. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I, I, tell me about I was, that. I know you mentioned um, earlier on in the conversation, you mentioned that it was a little, it's been at some times a little lonely. Tell us about that experience for you. So I, you know, I've had, I had my business. I, you know, my business started in Brooklyn and then I moved to Harlem and it was, it was fine. It was healthy. I felt very comfortable in the space. And again, with digital, sometimes you kind of lose sight with reality because mm-hmm. you kind of create your own little world. And when my business started reaching, I would say, I don't know, maybe half a million dollars in sales, for example, it started getting to a point where I couldn't just perform at my regular, um, safe comfort, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, comfortable. Okay. I'm just going to make a few dresses here and do a few there and see how it goes. I couldn't work like that anymore. So it kind of pushed me into really getting in the manufacturing side of things, um, really working with the modeling agencies, um, you know, like hiring a real, uh, accounting team, all those things. It, what it forced, I couldn't hide anymore and it made me realize how, how there, how few of us there are. So you start, you know, once you start working with one factory, you start seeing who they're working with and, you know, you create, you build a community. Everybody works in this space together and slowly but surely you just see so many others, but yourself. So it goes from, Oh yeah, I'm working with my intern or my um, assistant or my, um, my current, you know, people on my team who will look like me to, oh, I'm working with all these ex, ex, uh, ex, 
experts and, and suppliers and vendors who look nothing like me, but they have so much power mm-hmm. <laughs> into my business moving forward. So in that sense, I, I think it's, it's very unique. A lot of times people don't think Rue 107 is black owned. It, they don't think it's woman owned. Um, I get asked that question all the time or we see it on social media. So it's, it's very interesting what happens when you decide when you know when when I decided to go further and it's not just this is not going to be like quote unquote black brand you know like I think there's a lot of um, a lot of people want feel more comfortable putting people in boxes <laughs> that right makes, yeah no that makes sense because once they see you they think oh this is a black brand or something like that yeah yeah Whereas with would, other brands they wouldn't do that or other people. Exactly. And and I realized, you know, once again, once we got to a certain level with the business, I realized the power is not, it's not external. It's really internal. Mm-hmm. It's how many people you can hire. It's how many jobs you can create. It's how many people you can service, you can reach with your business. And the faces you put on there, of course, that plays a role. Um, but the real power doesn't come from that. Um, you can have a, 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 you know, the real power, you can have a, a brand that only caters to quote unquote an urban black market, but nobody behind it is black. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you know, I see it all the time. So it's very important to really create diversity on the back end and really build something powerful um, at the foundation of the company, not just what you see on the outside. So that's been like definitely one of my biggest lessons um, in, in this journey for sure. Would you say that you've also learned any lessons um, about needing to yourself be further out in front? As you mentioned, you know, you, we all can get into this bubble, whatever business we're doing, especially if it's anything involving digital. But then there gets a point gets there comes to a point, excuse me, where eventually you have to step out front in some ways. Yes, definitely. I I've been. Um I've definitely felt like I'm reaching that stage, which, you know, includes this podcast and <laughs> talking mm-hmm. to people like you, Yay. Um, I a, a lot of it has to do, um, again, once you reach a certain milestone in your business, you kind of you kind of realize your own power. And if I can do this, imagine if so many of us collectively do it, how powerful we'll be. Mm-hmm. So it's really not about, um, at some point you have to create, systems right and and a system and sisterhood and it's it's not just having a successful business it's also having a voice and having impact and 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 you know teaching and inspiring and creating more of a community that reflects your journey um because no matter what i will never be you know, I'm I'm Marie. I'm the Haitian girl who came to America, who built this company. Um, I don't have an uncle in manufacturing. I don't have you know a, a brother in finance who's, who's you know financing the companies. I literally had to build this in a way that's so like hit to the bone sometimes. Mm-hmm. Elaine, so, you know, it's been like really really challenging to get to this space. So I felt like it is my responsibility to talk about it and to also let people know they're not crazy like this is not designed for you and it's it's not because people are mean it's just we weren't the ones who built this industry right we didn't make these rules so we have to create our rules and and play with the other's rules and Mm -hmm. build something that's unique to us too so my voice is it's not I don't want to just Instead about having social media followers and talking, you know, just for talking and calling myself a girl boss and a CEO, it's really to talk, to have an honest dialogue about this journey and also let people know it, it is possible. It, you know, we can do it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, we need to have more honest conversations. <laughs> Right. I think that's, um, thank you for saying that and for sharing that too, um, because I know sometimes we get into this space where we don't want people to see that side of things or you don't want to share that part of the journey. But I think that's the thing that people really need to know about, not even to, obviously, you're not dissuading anyone from doing anything. You're actually inspiring people by saying it's very challenging. This wasn't, you know, this business wasn't designed with you in mind, but you're an example of we can do it. Exactly. Exactly. Do you feel like you have any um, allies or I would say mentors or people like that in the business or that you've developed any over the years that have made it more or less lonely? Um, I I feel like I have 
allies for um, I definitely know other designers who I really respect and I, I, I love what you know what the brands are about and what they're doing as far as mentors um, on the business level um, it's something I'm hoping to find more mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I yeah, I, I, I would definitely say at this time, I'm a little bit perplexed by some of the some of professionals I've hired and consultants and people I've, I've dealt with to um, help me with with moving the business forward. And it just really made me realize um, it, just, it made me realize what I do and not to take it for granted, because not a lot of people are doing it. And two. um Finding a right mentor, um, it, it, I have to put more work in it. I, to be completely with you, honest with you, uh, Elaine, I've been going through a very weird stage of, um, it's, I don't want to say it's negative, but it's a little bit dark in terms of, I feel like there's a lot of sexism. <laughs> there's a lot of, mm-hmm. you know, the industry is for women, but it's all men on top. And I've, you know, I've recently fired a, a consultant about three months ago and he was so disgusting when I fired him. He took it so bad mm. and he tried to be so vicious, you know, like stealing my patterns and, and just really mean things that I feel a little bit disgusted by some of the professionals, you know, so. Um, or people who are supposed to be professional. Yeah, yeah. In, in our, in my industry specifically. Now, I, I do think on the media side and, and PR, it's a little bit lighter. There, uh, it feels like they're, it seems like there might be more of us, but on the manufacturing end, oh my God, it's it's rough. I I don't have any mentors at this moment in that space, and and I hope that will change. So I'm seeking for it and I'm welcoming it. But right now I'm a, I'm still a little bit sore from that last sensitive from that last experience. Um, this person I literally came and asked them for an internship because they I thought they were exactly what I, I was like I, at this stage of my business I'm wanting to intern for you to learn manufacturing mm. and he was like well you don't have to intern for me you can just hire me and I was like you know what not a bad idea and he turned out to not know anything about e-commerce at all mm-hmm. and and you know I have to do my own due diligence as well so it's not just you know you should never admire anyone you should always see someone as having a different experience that you can inspire to, but you can never put them in a pedestal because that's dangerous. So they always dis- usually disappoint you in exactly. some way, right? Exactly, exactly. So I'm looking for a mentor, a mentor in um, in my industry. That would be great. Um, but right now, no, I don't have anybody I talk to. Uh, in this space, which is not good. <laughs> mm. Well, first of all, I'm sorry that you went through that. I know how that is to have a a tough business breakup. Um, you know, and I, I don't want to project what you're projecting on you, what you may be feeling, but I know I've gone through that in different ways with people that I thought I knew well, or and something happens and it falls apart, and they just seem to maybe they're becoming who they already were, and I just didn't realize it. But to me, it seemed like they became a different person. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, and it can be in some ways hurtful, or as you said, if it's someone, especially someone you admire and thought you could learn from, and it becomes this whole other experience, and then not having someone to talk to and those kind of things, I would imagine goes back to sort of what we talked about, there could be those lonely stages. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to find you a mentor. I wrote it down. <laughs> That's on my list. Yeah, we're going to find you a mentor. Because I think in all businesses, certainly in yours, because you're one of few, but I think in all businesses and as women entrepreneurs, it's so important for, well, my whole thing is support is sexy. So there's mm-hmm. that. But um, I just think it's important for us to connect and find ways to support each other during those, you know, lonely times, tough times, times when we have questions, times when we may be even doubting ourselves or the business or trying to figure out how to, whatever it is, how to move forward. So um, I just think it's crucial. And I I would imagine you're in a space maybe where you're thinking about those things too. Absolutely. You hit it right on the nail. Absolutely. What would you say um, the greatest misconception people have about launching and sustaining a clothing line is? The biggest misconception, I think, I think a lot of people think, you know, um, their idea or their design is going to change the market, is going to change things. Um, now, as important, design is important. You can't shortchange it. Uh, but there, there is an art to it. There is, 
th- there is a system, there's a way of doing it. It's not just you know, and I, I've learned that the hard way too for a long time. I just felt like, you know, I make the coolest prints. Everybody's going to love it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think uh, one of the biggest mis- misconceptions is just assuming that what you're doing is so powerful, so beautiful, is going to sustain a business. Um, that's just not true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so no matter how great you are, developing a business model developing uh, a customer, you know, customer um, retention program, uh, customer care, uh, your balance sheet, your P&L, your um, finances. There are no shortcuts. You have to understand money. You have to understand the customer and you have to give yourself time. So I think especially fashion is very exciting. So those are you know, there's this whole, I'm, I think a lot of people feel like they can just dive in and mm-hmm. it's going to be great, especially with the internet. You know, you can, people build a great website and they're like, wait a minute, nobody's buying. Right. So, you know, you need, you need a, a marketing strategy, uh, whether it's digital or word of mouth, whatever it is that you're going to do. But, and you need sales, you need to learn how to sell <laughs> in your market. So there, there are no shortcuts. So, you know, instead of spending hours developing a pattern, sometimes it's better to find the best pattern maker. Because if, if you, even if you're a designer, you need a team of people in production, right? So find a pattern maker, um, invest the money, and in, in not only making sure the pattern is great, but also um, save yourself the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and you know, a lot of designers tend to feel like because they spend a lot of time on something it makes it more valuable uh, and that's just not true you know we tend to when we're comparing for example you know they will compare their their clothing to H&M and they'll say the quality is terrible actually they use a lot of technique that's very industry standard so you can have you can have silk <laughs> that looks like crap but because you're saying it's silk does not mean that people are going to buy it mm-hmm. so Learn to work with your material. Learn to make a great garment. If you're comparing a silk shirt, don't compare it to an H&M, H&M garment. Buy a high-end silk shirt that you you think you're, com- you're comparing your product to and make sure it matches the standard. Um, so, so, yeah, I would say don't, yeah, be, be honest with yourself. Develop things um, well. Create a, a, a great team of people. And that sometimes it's tough at first by yourself. But there are a lot of external people who can, I mean, especially now people need work. So don't try to do it, everything yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, yes, you can build your initial first web page, but you need a developer, you need people, you need a team. And a lot of people will work on an hourly basis. You don't have to hire so many people (laughs) at once. Excellent. Do you feel that um, also with, with, um, social media I mean I know your Instagram is fantastic everyone go check out Rue 107 on Instagram and as as we mentioned earlier it's such a celebration of all women shapes sizes ages and I know you're going to do even more of that in different ways moving forward but would you say too that sometimes um, people in in fashion or even models or whoever believe that because you have a big social media following that that translates to automatically translates to sales oh my god yes (laughs) yes I see so many people chasing the followers versus chasing the sale. Mm-hmm. It's it's really it's a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous mentality. Um, you don't want you want quality over quantity when it comes to social media. You know we're we've developed. My, I've, I have about two hundred and twenty eight thousand followers, but it took me four years to develop that. I know people who had like double that in a year. Right. Um, and, you know, they spend a lot of money with influencers and different things to build a following. But that does not equate to having a healthy business. So I was literally talking to somebody uh, recently about this. They own um, an app on, in, in Silicon Valley. And I was doing some of the beta testing uh, for their new um, new um, marketing, like digital marketing platform. Mm-hmm. And he had people who literally had triple the followers we've had and had less than a quarter of our sales, um, like conversion rate. So it's really not 
of course, everyone wants to see your numbers go up, but that's really second to how you're talking, how you're communicating with that. How your engagement is. Engage, exactly, exactly. And, and what's the conversion? Are these people coming back to you? Are they asking you questions? Are they emailing you? Are they buying? You know, so. What do you think has been the key to your growth on, um, on all of your platforms? But do you think it's how you engage with the customer as much as it is the models and how beautiful it all is? Yeah, I will definitely say how we engage the models. We do have our, our girls are gorgeous. Yes. But also, you know, we move quickly. I don't have an attachment to to uh, collections. I release clothes. You know, we're trying to do, uh, uh, we're trying to do, I would love to release new products weekly, but we're doing uh, twice a month. And, you know, if something doesn't sell, I put it on sale and I move forward. I don't, it's fun for me. It's not, it's not just about, you know, taking advantage of people's, uh, you know, tendency to be, to consume so much clothing, but it's, it's, there are a lot of people to reach. So we don't make tons of clothing. We sell a quant- uh, limited quantity. And if it sells out, if it's, we move on, like we move quickly. We mm-hmm. always keep, always engaging. We're always bringing new stuff. And yeah, so that, I think that's the biggest thing. Our girls, our followers are always stimulated. They're always seeing something new and, and that's fun. You know, that's what people give us. So that's what we're trying to give them. So I think it's smart too, what you said about, uh, well, one, you, as you mentioned, you'd sort of do small, uh, or smaller lines or more limited lines, right? Or collections exactly. rather, right? So that, mm-hmm. and then uh, this idea of not being attached to things, I think is true or, or could be helpful for people to hear in all kinds of businesses. You know, we're, we're attached, or as you said, thinking this is the most beautiful or the best or everybody's going to love this and you hold on to it or keep trying to push it when people aren't responding to it. Whereas if you move exactly. on, yeah, you can inspire maybe new connections with people or, you know, that line or design or whatever you're doing might do better than the one you thought was going to be the one which I know happens even to me a lot you think oh this is going to be such a great whatever and then it's like oh this other one is the one that people like people will let you know what's working exactly (laughs) yeah exactly you have to give yourself room to really for every for everything to come through your pores in and out and move and move around and you have to allow um, the space for that kind of exchange because it's you know it, it helps with your creativity and it also makes you a better business person because if it was just about you, then, you know, you'll have a reality show. It's not just about you. You're, you, you, to have somebody buy your product is an honor and to service them is an honor. So you should, operating from that point of view is very important. Um, so th- I think that's, that's crucial. Did you go to school for design? Did you study design at all? No, I went to school. So, um, so I went. <laughs> I always laugh with my education. So I went in high school. I, my mom and my sister actually enrolled me in a licensed practical nursing mm. program. Mm. So when I graduated high school, I was a licensed practical nurse. Wow! Um, I worked uh, from eighteen to twenty six as a licensed practical nurse. Uh, although I went to college for my registered nursing, I never finished. <laughs> mm-hmm. So because of that, I couldn't work as an RN, even though I had tons of credits and did clinicals all over the city, the clinicals at Bellevue, uh, Mount Sinai, just different hospitals and, and nursing homes. But I worked as a licensed practical nurse. So, so yeah, I don't have any, um, I never went to school for, for this at all. Um, Never so just cultivated a natural talent that you already had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, you know, I, I do work. I've worked with coaches. I've um, I've hired uh, consultants on a very limited basis. Mm-hmm. That last consult, that story I told you was the most involvement I've had with the consultant, which is why it was so disappointing. Because mm-hmm. I work with people at a you know lighter capacity um, uh, for specific issues that I've had, and they've been great. But um, Anyway, so, yeah, I, I've had, I guess, different forms of education, but not not like the school classroom kind. No, not for this. <laughs> so what would you say then that you wish someone would have told you early on about uh, being a, a clothing designer? Ooh. I wish someone would tell me um, to never be afraid of my potential. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for a long time I felt very scared of my own dreams. Um, I try to, for example, when I was 18, I, I launched a collection, quote unquote, and it was 
of course, I didn't know anything about production and I couldn't produce the line. It was, it was bad. Um, but the clothes were really cute. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but I, so I felt like, because I guess of the failure of that, I felt like that was too, maybe being a designer was too big of a dream. So I did other things. I did styling. I, you know, I had a vent, little vintage showroom. I did some, um, some custom jewelry. I did, we had a, a, a company that did rework vintage. <laughs> So I did just a bunch of things around being a, a fashion designer, but I never, I never really pursued it again until eight years later. So I think, the, and ever since it's been everything, every time things have gone horribly wrong is because I trusted someone or a process that was not aligned with my real purpose and my real um, guiding, guiding figures, which to me is my faith. And, and my, my ability to work, you know, like you, you always going to have, it's important to have an amazing team. It's very important, but what's most important is to develop for me anyway, to develop faith and, and, and learn how to pray and learn how to de- develop a spiritual side. Um, cause in business, you, I think you need it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I think you, it sustains it, you. It sustains, it sustains me. It, it fuels me because um, the challenges are just too, it's too harsh. Like you just, there's just no way you can sustain it and keep going forward when so many, like you're human, right? So I, I think, um, I think that's what somebody, I wish somebody had told me to work on my spiritual side sooner and, and develop that muscle sooner. Have you ever thought about um, bringing in, and maybe you've done this before, a partner who can just focus on the the quote unquote business side, meaning manufacturing and all of those things, while you're able to focus more on uh, the design or creative side? Has that ever been a thought for you? Because I know right now you're doing everything, and as you know, when we first start out, most of us as entrepreneurs, it's just us trying to do everything. But I was just curious if that was ever an idea for you. Yeah, it, it crossed my mind, um, but I'm not there yet. I think the main thing before you bring anyone on board, uh, you need to build the foundation of your business as much as possible. Um, so that's right now. That's eventually I will definitely be very open to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm at that last stage of I feel like I need to get the company to a certain stage before I can bring on anybody else. So, so yeah, I thought about it, but I think, you know, like anything else, it's just, there's no rush. Right. I'm not running, I'm, you know, it's a marathon. It's, there's no need to, and, and honestly, nobody can save your business. Like nobody can save your business, but God and you, which would lead to the right people. So you have a lot of the answers. You don't have all the answers, of course, but it's really important to, for me, to develop my true leadership to have something very solid to show for it. So when somebody else comes in, they know this is not, oh, I'm going to fix you or I'm no. going to beat you. It's no. more like an equal partnership. Right. So, and I, I feel like I'm almost there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to, I feel like I've, I'm growing a lot and my confidence is growing. And I, I, I just kind of want to just, you know, work with that a little bit longer before I, I bring somebody else in. Understood. Okay. So I saw a quote on her agenda, actually, where you said, I couldn't sleep. I could almost taste it. I had to do it. That was stronger than not doing it. And that wasn't an option for me. So I assume you were talking about designing or launching your line at that time. Yes, I would call that (laughs) that. Yeah, definitely uh, launching my business. So I, you know, I, I don't, I used to call myself a fashion designer, a business owner, or just an entrepreneur. But now I call myself more of an e-commerce fashion entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I, all those things you, you know, you mentioned designing and, and, and having the business and launching, it's, it's so true. Like you have to get through that, but there's also a later stage that you realize once you take that step, you know, the most beautiful thing about entrepreneurship, I think, is the infinite possibilities of exploring your various self. Mm -hmm. So you don't just become you, you become all your elements of you are so enhanced and you, you, 
and you can see how you can touch other people, how you can be of service, how you can be, you can have a voice, how you can, and you can build wealth. You can do so much. So, so yeah, I, I think that's what was keeping me up at night, thinking back on it. You know, it wasn't just, oh, I need to design a dress. It was like, I need to at least know I tried really hard to reach my full potential in this lifetime. And, and I knew I had to do it. And I, I can't just, yes, it's scary. Yes, it's, it's tough. But if you're really truly embracing the journey for what it is, you will always be inspired to operate at a higher level. And you will never be comfortable. It's not a journey for the, com- for the comfortable. It's not designed for comfort. It's designed for peace and for uh, reaching more. I've talked to women, other women who have said, too, that and I I have felt this, that entrepreneurship is like the greatest form of personal development. (laughs) It'll let you know what you're made of or what you're not made of, what you're ready for, what you're not quite ready for. You just go through this journey where, like you said, really discovering who you are and what you'll sort of go all the way for. Exactly. Exactly. What what would you say? was there a moment rather that you realized that you had to do this? The, so I knew I always wanted to do it, but I would say my aha moment of, okay, I'm going to, I have to do this came after um, the quake happened in Haiti Mm. uh, in 2010. I remember feeling, you know, I was, when it just happened, I was working on the second floor at the nursing home in, in, in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. And sorry, I was working on the first floor and the call bell in room 107 just kept going off. And at this, but there was no patient in the call in the room. The call bell has been broken and I called maintenance a gazillion times to fix it. They will come and fix it and we'll go right back. So it just kept ringing so loud. And that was around the same time uh, when the quake happened. My mom called me. I'm on the floor. I'm not supposed to be on the phone. So, you know, she's telling me if I can try to send some you know, some money or package care package to Haiti. And she's giving me the address, which is we start seeing, which is where I grew up. And between the, me trying to speak to my mom and the sound of this super loud call bell going off without a patient in the room, it's just broken. I just remember feeling like, okay, this is, I'm done. I'm done. I'm ready. At this moment, I don't even know if my father is alive. I don't even know if the house I grew up in is still, I have no idea. I knew at that time, like life is too short. Um, and you can't live, you cannot do things for the sake of being comfortable. You have to go beyond your comfort zone. So that's where the name Rue 107 came from. And that was the day I decided I will, I will do this. I will go, I will go for this. There was no looking back. Wow. That's a powerful story. I had no idea. I'm so glad I asked (laughs) about that. That is powerful. And it's just that moment and everything that was going on in that moment that sort of pushed you forward. Exactly. Exactly. Would, would you say there was ever a moment then where you thought, what have I done? Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, out two years, yeah, almost two years, two years ago. Yeah, we, I had my toughest time in business. Um, I pretty much had to almost fire every, fire almost everyone. It was rough. Uh, the biggest reason for that was, you know, transitioning from size inclusive to plus size to straight size. I felt like my brand identity was completely confusing <laughs> to everyone. So I ended, up, I ended up canceling out a lot of people. Mm. And people were angry. People were hurt. Um, a lot of our straight size customers felt like, you know, what are you doing? You don't even sell to us anymore. A lot of our plus size customers felt like you're not even making it right in my size. I can't, the arm hold is too small. And I, so I just felt like I was letting everyone down, everyone across the board for a number of reasons. Um, and that was, that was very hard. And, and I, you know, I, that really, I was like, okay, I'm going to shut down the business. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. just move on from it because there was, I obviously, I, I can't do this. I, that was my, definitely my biggest breaking point of, um, this is not going to work. Uh, that's that's when I realized there was a chance that I can see how businesses fail. Um, and I got very, very lucky to get to that stage. I got very, very lucky. How did you get but to it was that definitely- stage? Well, I, the first thing, you know, I, I would say 
the people who was with me um, before that stage, and some of them are still with me now. now. Um, I had Melanie, who I work with day to day. Uh, Mel is, you know, she's like my right hand woman. <laughs> um, so Mel was, I would say, my biggest. You know, I have my boyfriend, I have my family, but Mel was sort the closest, mm -hmm. and her sheer, I've, her sheer just belief that Marie, we can get out of this. Um, just, you know, both of us breaking down, like we're, I'm like, Mel, payroll's dried up, we're gonna be out of work in two weeks, I'm letting you know right now. And just, I'll never forget that moment, you know, I'm sitting down with her, and, you know, she's crying, I'm crying, and at the same time, we're still like, but maybe we can still do this. <laughs> so we, we, will, we develop one last, one last strategy of, you know what, let's just stop trying to make basic co co basic clothing. Like I literally had two weeks left. I had to do, uh, uh, I had enough money for two weeks of a new collection mm -hmm. and payroll. So we relaunched a collection <laughs> with prints that I said I've always wanted to work with. I did a floral suit in this completely different view of have ever done Rue. And I bought back, you know, a straight size model. I had a plus size model both together and I just showed it and the girls loved it. Wow. They loved it. And that month saved my business for sure. And, um, you know, I also had uh, one of my, two of my seamstresses who are still with me now. They were also there and they made the samples and we had to, I couldn't hire the factories anymore. So we literally had to make everything for that collection in my, in my sample room. So we slowly rebuilt and grew and grew from that direction, which is again, my point earlier about a lot of times the answers are not already with you because I've wanted to do this for so long, but for some reason I felt like N women, plus size women and straight size women will never shop together. It will never happen. Now listen to everybody else but myself. So, and I think that's where faith plays a big role because if you haven't, if you're quiet and you're still and you keep your conversation between you and God, they, he will give you the answer and then the rest of it, you will have all the people. You will, you know, for me, having Mel, having Sarat, my sewing room, my cutter, my customer care team and then the factories and having all these people lined up the second I made that decision to listen to myself and let God guide me, everything fell into place. So, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much how we got out of that very dark, dark, dark time in business. <laughs> wow. How important is it to you to have, um, as a business owner and as a woman, to have people like that in your support network? People like Mel and the other women that you mentioned. It's it's everything. I think it's your biggest asset. It's your, um, you know, obviously outside of your faith, like I said, um, your team really is you. It defines you. You can't, you know, for me to have this, conversation with you I have you know my IT team is working my customer care is working Mel is working my studio is working uh, the factories are working my patterns and and marker people are working everyone is working to bring this service to our end customer so finding good people is crucial um, it's 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 very important I don't, I don't know how how you can do it without without that because you you can only do so much. <laughs> right. And then needing those certain people during those dark moments, as you mentioned. Exactly. 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 What would you say that um, entrepreneurship has taught you about yourself as a woman? Um, the, I would say the, hmm, the biggest thing entrepreneurship has taught me is to is that I cannot do it alone. I think, you know, when we're younger and we're like, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Hum uh, entrepreneurship humbled me. It made me, and not humbling and like the cheesy, you know, like, oh, I'm so humble. It's like, it really forced me to really understand my limitations and, and, and my weaknesses. And also giving a platform for other people to develop um, and to not be so afraid that people are going to steal your ideas or steal this from you or steal that from you. 
honestly, somebody can steal something. It doesn't mean anything because they can't do what you do. And operating from that perspective is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you have to have your contracts in place. You have to have professional boundaries. But you really have to cultivate a culture of growth and letting your team develop and give them room to develop. That's very important. So, um, so I, I would definitely say one of my biggest, one of the biggest things entrepreneurship taught me is to step back, chill, work on myself while allowing a safe space for my team and other people to work on themselves. And that includes customers. Sometimes a customer might not buy from you for, for a while. Um, because the last thing they bought from you didn't fit the right way or it didn't do what you said it's going to do or whatever. You have to give that customer room to feel that way and also take notes and see how you can do it better next time. So, you know, even when we do our returns now, um, every return we try to have a questionnaire, a, a vocal, a phone questionnaire to see what, to get real feedback, not just checking a box, you know, mm -hmm. like get real feedback and, and, you know, and we've been very lucky. I would say 98% of the time customers give it to us because we're like, we want to hear you, we want to talk to you and it's okay. We're still refunding you. This is about not getting a refund, it's, but it's really about letting, um, letting, letting others teach you where you can do better. And, and also giving them room to, to do the same. So and, and for internally for my team and for my customers, just again, how I can better serve them. So um, in closing, if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would it be and what would you say? My partner, Himanshu, um, Himanshu and I, we've been together for five years. He's been my rock, um, my biggest cheerleader. Uh, you know, those days when you're crying in your sleep, I wake up, he's holding me. Um, his support has been a miracle for sure. So, yeah, I would say Himanshu, my boo, my boyfriend. <laughs> Your boo, we love that. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. So tell us how we can support you. Give us your website again, social media, or anything that you want us to know in order for the audience to be able to support you. Thank you, Elaine. So my website is www.ru107.com, and that's R-U-E-107. And we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, handle at Ru107. And, you know, if you want to see beautiful images and be inspired and and shop a little bit, maybe, uh, we're the place to go. So. <laughs> Excellent. Marie, thank you so much. And thank you for your honesty and uh, your transparency. I really think it's going to inspire, but also touch a lot of people in ways of letting them know that they are not alone and what they might be experiencing and creating their businesses and that kind of thing. So I really just really appreciate your time and also you sharing your story the way that you did. Thank you so much, Lane. Thank you for your time. And yeah. thank you so much for having me. <laughs> of course. Now, the last word before you go, a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything. Ooh, about anything. Um, oh, I guess go on and live a little. <laughs> you know, though it's not it's serious, but it's not as serious. Peace is more important than um, peace is is the ultimate goal. It's not comfort. So finding peace through the most, you know, uncomfortable situations uh, will, I think, work wonders. So, um, so yeah, I would say. Seek your peace and uh, and your spiritual side. Nurture it. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, people are like, oh, we have to work out in the morning. I say, pray first. <laughs> so, yeah, I think I think I think that's that's the best advice I can give um, is to find that inner peace. Excellent, Marie. Thank you so much. Hold on for just one second. Sure. All right. Thank you so much for listening. For more information on Marie and Rue 107, please go to supportissexypodcast.com. You'll see links to all of her social media there, links to her website. All of the information and resources that she mentioned in this episode will be at supportissexypodcast.com, as well as interviews with other inspiring women entrepreneurs that we talk to five days a week. So thank you as always so much for being here. And now you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.